For many riders shopping for the second-hand motorcycle, the line between a shiny new bike fresh off the showroom floor and a Craigslist crap bike complete with more gooch juice than compression left in the engine looks razor thin. If you're shopping for a used bike, it can be hard to trust the seller and know for sure what bike is in a good deal and what could be a money pit that bankrupts your family and sends your wife back selling feet pics on OnlyFans. And while any bike that is exposed to hard riding crashes and neglected maintenance may not prove long for this world unless it's a Honda, there are quite a few motorcycles that are known the world over for being reliable, trustworthy, and just downright unkillable. So without further ado, let's talk about seven of the most unkillable used motorcycles. There's no way I could make this video without talking about this bike first. First up on the list of masochistic motorcycles that just refuse to die in the face of diversity is the Kawasaki KLR. Kawasaki has been making the KLR more or less unchanged since, what, like 1987? That's a nearly 40 year tenure, and it sure ain't because it's fast or attractive, but because it's a workhorse machine that will eat a bowl full of whatever trash you put in front of it with a smile on its face. There's a reason people call it the big fat pig. Run the engines on mayonnaise and moonshine and it will still take you to the highest peak of the Andes. Actually, don't put mayonnaise in your engine, that probably won't work, but maybe it will. That's a good video idea. And something to consider when buying a used bike is the general lifestyle and attitude of the people who ride them. And lucky for anyone mildly interested in a used KLR, they are typically owned by responsible but disheartened dads who take great pleasure in maintaining their motorcycle, as if it often means an opportunity to hide in the garage away from their family. And while a KLR would be happy to run on a crankcase full of hamburger condiments instead of oil, most KLR owners stay on top of regular maintenance. And most KLRs burn so much oil as is, it practically changes itself with the constant top-ups you have to do every time you get gas. It's almost like a rotary at that point. A secondhand KLR will likely come with some tasteful aftermarket ADV dad mods too, like a cup holder large enough to accommodate a 32 ounce Yeti tumbler, or something more practical like heated grips. Any KLR seller in the know will be quick to advertise that they have already completed the KLR doohickey circumcision, which has been considered to be one of the most essential modifications according to all KLR owners. I don't know what the hell it means. Another motorcycle that just refuses to die is the Honda Rebel 250. And I know, I know, this bike kinda sucks. And while it kind of does, it does have a purpose. It must serve a purpose. Decades and decades of free market scrutiny has deemed this motorcycle worthy of existence, so it has to exist for some reason. The Rebel 250 has outlasted countless cooler, faster, and more exciting motorcycles. And why is that? Because these dumb pieces of crap refuse to die. They are exposed to endless abuse at the hands of MSF course attendees, much like the unintentional misery a small child inflicts on their favorite action figure as they stick G.I. Joe down the garbage disposal and bury his severed limbs in the cat's litter box. A Rebel 250 will spend almost all of its life revved out in first gear with the clutch pulled in and have no problem with it. The rest of its life will be spent tipped over on its side while the MSF rider coaches run over to the student and with the release of liability waiver. So point being, these bikes are unkillable. We get that. But is there ever a reason to buy one? Possibly. Maybe you need ultra cheap, no frills transportation and always leave for your appointments two hours early. Because trust me, if you're riding a Rebel 250 on American roads, you're gonna need a bit of a head start to get to your destination on time. Or maybe you wanna buy a Rebel 250 to see if the unkillable can ever truly be killed. If you've got 500 bucks and a sick, twisted sense of humor, you can track down a Rebel 250 and see what it feels like to play God. Which, now that I think about it, is a pretty good video idea. Rebel 250 ultra reliability versus like a Chinese bike or something? That's a pretty good idea. I'm gonna write that one down. Or maybe you want an old slow cruiser that comes with a bit more brand recognition for the low price of being the punchline of lowbrow jokes from every other motorcyclist on the road, myself included. I am of course talking about a Harley Davidson Evo Sportster. Yes, it, we have to talk about this one too. The Sportster Rider is a unique type of masochist, a financial sub who gets off on spending money to be humiliated. Humiliation that comes from multiple directions, from various consenting partners raining down in a shower of insults and ridicule. This will come from every part of the motorcycle spectrum, including Harley Bears, Jixxer Twinks, and Triumph Tops. But the best part about being humiliated by riding a Sportster is recognizing that it will never end because these bikes just won't die. 
A few things that can lend themselves to a motorcycle longevity is a low stress engine with minimal components. And despite that these straight pipe V-twins can sound as stressed as an overweight politician, huffing and puffing up the stairs to his hotel room to meet his paid company because the elevator's out of order, an evil engine is about as understressed as a motorcycle can get, making like 40 horsepower after a stage one kit. And as for minimal components, an Evo engine is so simple it could practically be assembled from scrap metal at a Fallout 4 crafting station after drinking a few Nuka-Colas. If any of this sounds slightly appealing to you, I recommend finding a therapist. If therapy doesn't stick and you're convinced you want to use Sportster, well, you're in luck, because they've been practically the same since the 80s and are available to be purchased in various stages of disrepair. But sometimes, you'll find a clean Sportster that's been cherished by a 65-year-old woman and maintained by her husband, who's ready to let it go for the market value of 3500 bucks so she can upgrade to a trike. So I get asked a lot, Yam, what is your favorite motorcycle accessory? And to be honest, this is usually what I reach out for. This is called a rock form, and it's a phone mount for your motorcycle that's going to change your life. Rock form phone mounts are some of the best in the business because they basically defined the category. They're an all aluminum construction. They feature a vibration dampener. And to be honest, you can put these things on just about any motorcycle with a handlebar or clip-ons as well. They feature a stem mount or a handlebar setup that is pretty awesome. The first step is to get yourself the Rockform phone case, and that kind of opens up the whole ecosystem of products for you. Fans of the Yam are going to get 25% off by using the link down below and my code YN25. You're not going to want to miss it. That's a pretty good discount that they're offering my subscribers. So check out Rockform products. They are my go-to motorcycle accessory. This handlebar mount has been very, very useful for me when I'm traveling or just when I'm out somewhere on location and I need GPS on my phone quickly to access. So hit that link down below to Rockform and use the code YN25 for 25% off. But now you're asking, what about sport bikes, Yam? What type of bike is ridden almost exclusively at Redline by a 20 year old with daddy issues is the best to buy secondhand? Well, I hope you can sense the sarcasm in my voice because oftentimes finding a good deal on a used sport bike is as much of a Herculean feat as it is an oxymoron. But there are some gems out there if you know what bikes to look for and have realistic expectations emphasis on realistic like don't think you're gonna get an r6 for anything less than 10 grand nowadays because they've all lost their minds but for a used sport bike a lot of the times a bit older can be better they have less advanced computer systems that can go haywire if you forget to pay for the microtransactions for your fuel injectors they're just tried and true sport bikes an older bike is even better if it's owned by an older guy. For instance, can you find a K5 Jixxer 1000 for sale from a 40 year old enthusiast who has owned everything the last 15 years? Not a bad option if the service history checks out. You ever wonder why squids are able to abuse their Jixxer so hard without consequence? Well, it mostly comes down to dumb luck and testosterone, but also because these early 2000s four cylinder engines are kind of bulletproof. Too bad JFK wasn't wearing a helmet made out of K5 Jixxer engine parts. Uh, bad joke. Anyway, the use discretion when shopping for a used Jixxer. Obviously, that goes without saying. But if you're in the right place at the right time, you never know what might turn up. Another great sport bike that hails from the same glorious era that gave us Green Day's American Idiot and the cinematic masterpiece that is Wedding Crashers is the Kawasaki ZX6R, aka the 636 that was produced between 2003 and 2006. I recently sang this bike's praises in another video and I really think it's worth it. The extra cubes in the 636cc engine compared to the standard 600 make it much more suitable for degenerate driving on the street, allowing you to make power without having to keep the engine at redline the entire time. These bikes are another relic of a lost era of the early 2000s, when you didn't need a whole suite of rider aids to feel comfortable going 186 miles per hour indicated on the speedo. The same way you didn't need to win the popular vote in order to be awarded the presidency. Also, these bikes are a little more subtle stylistically. The design choices as a whole were a little more reserved than Kawasaki's are these days, which are far more aggressive and angular. The Kawasaki 636 are a common motorcycle to be built up as stunt bikes, so if that's something you want to get into as a 636, it would be a good platform to build on. But they're still super good bikes to ride as is. They're fuel injected, make like 115 horsepower at the wheel, and don't have Siri built into the ECU telling you what you can and can't do. Throttle control is at the wrist, and wheelie control is at your right foot. And if you snowflakes can't handle that, maybe you should go drive your Tesla down to the electric motorcycle store and get yourself a battery-powered Barbie bike that's the same color as your feelings journals. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that to you.
I love you. I always will. I don't want to yell. I Please take me back. No one can make an unkillable motorcycles video without mentioning the Suzuki SV650. The SV650 is similar to bikes like the Sportster in a lot of ways. I mean, unlike the Sportster, the SV definitely makes more power than a toaster oven, but it's kind of like, why? You know, it's like driving a Toyota Corolla. Good car, sensible car, but like, why? Because you hate cars, but you absolutely need to have one in order to exist in the world? But the thing is, you don't need to have a motorcycle, yet there are so many SV650s in the wild in various states of decline. Like if someone opened a dealership that only sold SV650s, it would feel more like the lobby of a DMV than a motorcycle dealership. The SV650 is so versatile and so ephemeral, it just sort of is devoid of all identity. It's just like, motorcycle. Pretty average in every way, exceptional at nothing. Cheap, easy to find, reliable, easily customizable, but at the end of the day, it's just another SV650 some rider got bored of. And if he chose to sell it for $2,000 instead to destroy it with fire. SV650s are fine, they're good bikes. Like I said, if you are a rider with no discernible characteristics or opinions and don't want to be recognizable anywhere you go, maybe the milk toast anonymy of an SV650 is the move. And at the end of the day, they're definitely unkillable, so they make the list. See also the Suzuki v strong Okay, so we have the boring cruisers of yore, we have unadulterated sport bikes of yesteryear. Where is there left to go? So we know the Honda CB750 is known to be one of the best motorcycles ever made, or redefining motorcycles as a whole, and set fire to both Triumph and Harley's PL statements in the 1970s. So I'm not gonna mention the CB750 as an official list entry, but instead I will lump in every air-cooled four-stroke UJM that came afterward. So these are bikes like the Yamaha XS1100, Suzuki GS1100, or the Kawasaki KZ1000. Essentially all of these bikes, whether they've been cared for or not, refuse to die. They are marvels of over-engineering and simplistic design. No need to worry about fuel injectors or liquid cooling, or a lot even the times chain maintenance. An air-cooled four-cylinder engine and shaft drive will really just run forever. There is nothing to break. They're big and heavy and slow by modern sport bike standards and fast by modern Harley standards. They just kind of work. You'll still find these UJM bikes for sale on Craigslist or Marketplace in running order today. And because these bikes were produced in such massive quantities, parts are pretty common and easy to find and even up despite the age of the machines. So it feels like a bit of a cop out to have an entire era of motorcycles as a list entry, but the UJM bikes from the 70s and 80s really set a standard for reliability. Just ask the boomer that rides the completely mint UJM with a full set of color match Vetter brand panniers and fairings. I had this baby since 1974, bought her right off the dealer floor. I don't do much other than to change the oil once a year if I get around to it and drain the carbs each winter. Still ride her coast to coast if my sciatica back pain hadn't started to get too bad. Have fun on a crotch rocket pansy. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Fact. Oprah Winfrey was actually named Orpa after the biblical figure, but her name was misspelt on her birth certificate, and she's gone by Oprah ever since. Sounds a lot better if I'm not going to lie. Goodbye. Keep watching Amy Noob!